It is my privilege to be here. And it's my joy to be here with so many beautiful women of the Lord. And I want to ask Our Lady just to bless you, just to cover you with her mantle. Because the greatest mission, the greatest vocation of women is just to be like Our Lady. Many women are looking to be something else or somebody else. And the great somebody else that we are to become is just a little bit like our mother. Wonderful women that are merry young women that can change the world. So I just want to begin with a Hail Mary so our lady can help me to communicate to your beautiful hearts the desire of Jesus' heart for you. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. All for the heart of Jesus, to the heart of Mary. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before I begin, I just want to let you know that, you see, Father Joe, it, he's not easy to be loved. Uh, he's going to be confessing at any time, whenever you want to, just get up and confess. Which that is the greatest thing you can do. You don't have to listen to me. You have to listen to Jesus. Okay? Well, I am supposed to be the keynote speaker. I don't know why they always call me to be the keynote speaker. I just want to be simply a speaker. <laughs> it does what God wants. But uh, I had to be honest, when I received the title of the talk, I had to laugh. I said, what am I going to say about that? I said, are you sure you want me to speak about the holy woman at the empty tomb? I said, he said, yes. Okay, what am I going to say, Lord? I was still asking what I was going to say Thursday night. So I'm going to come up with whatever the Holy Spirit plays in my heart and whatever he places while I am speaking. First of all, it's the first time that I speak about the holy women at the empty tomb. But when I was just meditating on the gospel and going deep into the gospel and going with them inside the tomb, there were so many beautiful uh, details of feminine love that I was able to uh, open my eyes to and open my heart to. First of all, we have to realize that in the four Gospels, this is an event that is mentioned with particularities in every Gospel. Why, and just in case that somebody may say to you, but why one Gospel makes so much details and the other one is not so much detail? Well, because you have to take an account that the Gospels are written by men inspired by God. It is the word of God, but they're writing to particular communities, they're writing to particular situations, they're also writing with their own experience of what happened. So the fact that you find so many details in one and little details in the other, that doesn't mean that the event is not real. It just means that it's narrated to us by the, the masculine gift of those who wrote it. The ones that are very detailed are the ones that were very close to a lady. That tells you something. The masculine genius that is close to the feminine genius is the one that learns to see with the eyes of love and the eyes of details. So in the four Gospels we read, about this gesture of love of women who led by Mary Magdalene, they went after this, the Sabbath, and this is gonna be very important as we understand what happened. They went after the Sabbath early in the morning. What does that mean? When the sun was beginning to appear, when the sun was rising, on the first day of the week. What is the first day of the week? Because for us it's Monday. But that's not the first day of the week. It is Sunday. 
say it a little bit aloud, just will remember? Sunday, because that is the day that Jesus resurrected. So they went when the Sabbath was finishing, because we have to remember culture has a lot to do also with the spirituality. When was this, the beginning of the Sabbath? On Friday when the sun was going down. When does it finish? Early morning on Sunday when the sun is going up. Why is that gonna be important? Not because I wanna give you a geography class or whatever, astronomy class, because we're gonna understand why the gestures of love take place at the moment that they took place. So they go, led by Mary Magdalene, with oils that they had prepared to anoint the body of Jesus. Where are they going? To the tomb. To the tomb where they saw Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus placing the body of the Lord. They're going, and this is something that has struck my heart so much, because we women, we have a lot of gifts, but we also have a lot of defects that we need to change. One of them is that we love to be worried about everything. <laughs> and if we don't have anything to be worried about, we invent them. <laughs> we have to create problems, you know? So can we can justify why we're anxious when the Lord said, do not be anxious about anything. But something beautiful about Mary Magdalene and the women that were going with them, with him, with her, I'm sorry, to the tomb, is that they only had one concern. That's a lot for women, just to have one concern. <laughs> they were not concerned about being persecuted. They were not concerned about the guards that were there to take notes of the, their names. They were not concerned about the repercussions of being seen taking care of the body of Jesus. They were not concerned about themselves. This is the first teaching. They were not concerned about the consequences for them. Because love is not concerned about ourselves. Love is always concerned about the one that we love. What was the concern of these women? How are we gonna move and remove this, the stone? I mean, this is heavy. The stone that closes the tomb, how are we gonna remove it? Their concern is, how are we gonna get close to Jesus? Dear women who are here, you know what is the only concern you have to have in your heart? How am I gonna remove from my own heart the stones that are blocking to experience the life of Jesus in my heart? So you have to promise me that today you have no anxieties, no concerns, except how am I going to remove the stones in my heart so I can embrace and hold and see and contemplate the beauty of my Lord, Jesus Christ. These women followed Jesus from Galilee. They found Jesus in Galilee. They all had different experiences of Jesus and the way that Jesus touched their lives and converted their lives. They followed Jesus through his public ministry. But Mary Magdalene, I'm gonna speak a little more about Mary Magdalene because she's a central figure in the topic that they gave me. Mary Magdalene had the privilege to be a singular witness, a special witness to the crucifixion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. She had suffered with Our Lady, accompanying Our Lady she has suffered contemplating the God's incarnate love being rejected, 
wounded, marked, scorched, nailed to the cross. She also had listened to the last words of Jesus, the seven last words. She listened to those words. She saw the power of Jesus' love, the power of his love to the extreme, the power of his love to the end, up to the point of allowing his heart to be pierced. She is also an eyewitness of the piercing of Jesus' heart, of which, as we just celebrated in Mercy Sunday, immediately blood and water gushed forth from his heart as a fountain of grace, mercy, and salvation. There's a beautiful detail here. Jesus was already dead when they pierced his heart. Was it really necessary to pierce his heart if he was already dead? But they wanted to make sure that he was dead because the Sabbath was coming. So they needed to make sure that all the three were dead before the Sabbath, because they had to be buried before the Sabbath. So they only re killed Jesus, if we want to say it, by piercing the heart of the Lord. But the Lord gave us the greatest teaching by allowing his heart to be pierced after his death. And what came out of his heart? Blood and water, blood that delivers us from all sin and water that purifies us and makes us pure. What is he saying? That death is not the last word. Life is the last word. That love is greater than death. That even after death, he continued to give us life. Our Lady, St. Mary Magdalene, and St. John were the eyewitnesses of the greatest love ever contemplated by humanity. They were the first ones to receive upon themselves the sprinkle, if you want to call it, of blood and water when it was pierced so violently and blood and water gushed forth. I love the way in the movie of the Passion of Christ they put it, this torrent of blood and water. Of course it had to be that way because it is, it is the turn of mercy. And so they were the first ones to receive the fruits of the blood and the water that gush forth from the heart of our Lord. There was a little difference. A lady placed her hands to receive the blood, the blood of their, her son, so no drop of his blood will fall on the soil. She is always the perfect chalice, the perfect recipient of the body and blood of her son. And I can imagine, as we saw it in the, in the movie, that drops of blood fell upon St. John and Mary Magdalene. Can we imagine that moment when they are the first ones to receive the blood of Christ, the one that we receive every day in Holy Communion? When a lady extended her hands to receive the greatest treasure of her son's heart, when she was manifesting her mission from beginning to end, to be the custodians of everything that belonged to Jesus. That's why four times St. Luke said that Our Lady kept all things where? But he says, not a couple of things, not some memory. She kept very carefully, said St. Luke, very carefully, because we women, supposedly, we are supposed to keep everything very carefully. That means orderly. 
by date. And we women like that? We put dates where we wear, what kind of dress had my daughter when she went to the first, first communion, what kind of this, what kind of that. But now we don't have photo albums, sadly. Now the photo albums are in the phones, which that's good, that's okay. But we should have photo albums, print them because the, the phone can broke can break any time. But it's the woman that wants that keeps all the memories in her heart. The memories are the ones that she loves. Our Lady, Mary Magdalene, St. John, hear, heard Jesus saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they have done. They were the ones to hear, it is all accomplished. But we cannot overlook one detail that we don't think so much about. A lady, Mary Magdalene and John, were at the foot of the cross. There were other women at Calvary, but the gospel says that they were watching from a little distance, they were not at the foot of the cross. Therefore, Mary Magdalene, I consider her, you don't have to believe me, but I consider her to be the only eyewitness. And not only that she saw, she heard. When Jesus said to Mary, Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And so Mary Magdalene is the only witness to the gift that Jesus gave us at the end of his life, the maternity of Our Lady for us and the church. And she had to testify to this maternity, not only St. John. St. John was the recipient in the name of all the apostles of the maternity of Our Lady over the apostles but not only the apostles, the whole church. So Mary Magdalene was also representing the whole church. But we had never thought that she was the eyewitness of the maternity of Our Lady over the church. Since the Sabbath was approaching, and this is important, this is Friday in the afternoon, and the Sabbath is approaching, is that they receive the order to make sure that they have died. And in the Gospel of Luke, we hear something very beautiful. That there is a man that is called Joseph of Arimathea. Who was Joseph of Arimathea? He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a hidden disciple of the Lord, one that didn't have the courage to stand up and defend him, even though he was trying to. But why don't we seek for more eyewitnesses? Why don't we hear more? I mean, he was trying to stop the plan that they had against Jesus, but he was not openly saying, I believe in Jesus. But when Jesus died, the one that said, I have no place to lay my, he my head. And we said at the beginning of his life, no? He didn't have a house where to be born. And he had to be born in a stable in a manger made by St. Joseph. And at the end of his life, he had to be buried. But the gospel said that he had no burial place. Can you imagine that Jesus did not have a place to rest after his death, except the heart and the embrace of his mother? But he had no place to be buried. So Joseph of Arimathea had bought a few meters away from Calvary, had bought a tomb. And you may say, why did he buy it there? 
Well, because we think of Calvary, what it is, this big rock. And for those who have gone to Holy Land, you see the big rock. But that is, it was a garden. And you're going to see the proof that it was a garden. So he bought that burial place for himself, not knowing that Jesus was going to be crucified there. But when he saw that Jesus died and there was no place to bury him, he went to Pilate. Ah, so we begin to see that the love of Jesus manifested on the cross began to change the heart of Joseph. He took the courage to go to Pilate and said, can I take the body so I can bury him? And Jesus said, yeah, yeah, you can take him. But suddenly we have a second man that was very much in hiding in the public life of Jesus, Nicodemus, who went at night to speak with Jesus. Why did he go at night? Because he didn't want to be seen. But at the moment of the death of Jesus, he appeared, and together with Joseph and Arimathea, they carried the body of Jesus to the tomb. And they had oil. But there's a detail here. Our Lady and Mary Magdalene had few time, actually, to spend to do the ritual of the anointing. They did the anointing, but not as they usually do, because the Sabbath was about to begin. So they take, the men take the, the body of the Lord to the tomb, and Our Lady and Mary Magdalene are following him. Why do you think they're following them? Because they want to see how are they going to place the body of the Lord. Sisters, we have to see how the body of the Lord in the Eucharist is placed. We have to see that the tabernacle is a dignifying place. We have to see that the way that the Eucharist is treated is dignifying. That's the mission of women. That's one of the mission of women in the church. When they saw that they put him in on the tomb, they wrapped him in a linen. That, does that remind you of the beginning of the life of Jesus when a lady wrapped him in swaddling clothes and also in a white linen? When they wrapped him in a white linen, the whole body, and then with two little linens, they put it on the face because that was the tradition until, I think, 1950s, that you would put a little linen in the face of the, the person who had died. And they anointed the body of Jesus quickly also inside of the tomb. So therefore, after that, Our Lady goes out and goes, where did she go? We exactly don't know. We have two theories. She went to the house of the family of John or she went to the synagogue. But she had to go probably to the synagogue in prayer to expect and wait for the resurrection of her son. Now, there's another detail of a woman. On Monday, Holy Week, basically Monday, Jesus was in Bethany. He was in Jerusalem and he went to Bethany to visit his friends and spent the last days before entering the time of the Passion with Lazarus, who he had just resurrected, with Martha and Mary and his mother. Can you imagine, dear sisters, the dialogue between Jesus and a lady in the days prior to the Passion? And maybe Jesus saying, Mother, no matter what you see, 
you have to be silent. No matter what you see, don't defend me. Nobody, if you see me falling on the, on the floor with a cross on top of me, don't move. You have to suffer with me. You are the woman chosen to be the one closest and the associate to my sacrifice for the salvation of, of men. How many things they spoke, we don't know. How many things they spoke, I'm sure of something that he said to Lazarus. Lazarus, I don't want to see you in Jerusalem. I don't want to see you following me in the way of the cross. But master, my friend, how, how am I going to be with you? Of Martha, of Mary. He said, you know, they chose to crucify me. This is the last drop of the cup because I resurrected you. If you go, they're going to kill you. So how many dialogues they have to be, be happening in the house of Bethany? But something beautiful that's happening is that Mary, on that Monday, anointed the feet and the head of Jesus. And he said something, that that action had prepared him for his death. What did he mean by that? Remember that they were going to have to anoint him with a short time because the Sabbath was coming. So he allowed Mary to take his time to prepare him for his death because he knew that the, his mother and the other women were not going to have enough time to do it. Do you see how women are acting? I mean, if we're going to speak about women in the life of Jesus and in the life of the church, we're going to spend around 15 years. But we're, we need to see how the Lord is allowing and restoring not only the dignity of women, but also the mission of women in the life of the church. Then they had to go because it was the Sabbath, but as soon as the Sabbath was over, they went to the tomb with oils, with nard, with all these beautiful oils that you find in Holy Land. Why did they go? You know, because if we're going to think how many of us may be thinking, he's already dead, he's in his tomb, um, why do we have to go? Sadly, many people think that way. Oh, you know, the church, I, the priest, he doesn't, I can hardly understand him. Why am I going to go to Mass? I know that church is five minutes farther than when I want to drive. Why am I going to go? You see, our justifications for not loving are many. Why did they go to the tomb not knowing if they were going to be able to see him because they didn't know how they were going to open up and roll up the door? Love moved their hearts, dear sisters. Only love can move us to express Love for Jesus, and in, in spite of all the obstacles, difficulties. Ah, it's raining. I oh, know, get out of the house when it's raining. It's always going to rain, as far as I know. We have a problem when it doesn't rain, isn't it? I know it's too hot. I know it's too cold. Brothers and sisters, uh, no, there's no brothers. Oh, yeah, there's one. Uh, <laughs> sisters, love has to make us be who we are. And we women were created to be courageous. Not to stop before any obstacles. Obstacles we will have all, all of our lives. We have to surpass them because love is greater than death. 
And that's what these women were saying and teaching us until today. Nothing should stop you to go and love Jesus and do whatever Jesus needs you to do. They had encountered the love of Jesus. I want to ask you something. Have you encountered the love of Jesus? Raise your hand. Don't be afraid. We need more hands, isn't it? If you have encountered the love of Jesus, you know how much Jesus loves you. He loves you up to the cross. He loves you up to the Eucharist. How much are you going to love him? Because one of the beautiful things about women is that the only way that we are measured is not by all the honorary degrees that I'm going to receive. I don't care. Praise God if the Lord wants to give it for the good of the church and for the, the glory of God. I don't care. We're not measured by anything we do, by all the accomplishments, which is good that we have them. We are measured by our capacity to love in a sacrificial way. That is the identity of women. Women have the capacity to love without limits. You're going to hear throughout the days examples of women who have taught us to love without limits. I want to lead you to the face of the one that teaches all women how to love, which is the Blessed Mother. Without limits. Love without limits is not love. So when you say, I love you, but, <laughs> there's no love. And that should be also your discernment, those who are seeking to be married, or those who are already married, or those who, I don't know. <laughs> to say I love you is really easy. To live. Love is a test. And where will it be tested? On the cross. So don't believe in the ones that tell you, I love you. I cannot live without you. Are you willing to sacrifice for me? That's what I tell the young women when they said, my boyfriend is asking me this and this and as a proof of my love. <laughs> and I said, why don't you answer? And why don't you prove your love to me by not asking me to do that? Oh, yeah. we have to become a little more intelligent, huh? <laughs> we are the ones that have the power to show that there's no limit to our sacrifice. There is no limit to what we can give out of love. That is a capacity that we women have. It is engraved in our hearts. It's one of the aspects of our feminine genius. I love Jean Paul that he gave that definition to us. We have the feminine genius. That means the characteristics that are proper to our feminine heart. And you know what is the greatest work of the devil? And I have to say it with name. Because people don't like to say his name. I don't like his name either. But I have to say it. You know which is the greatest work of the devil? It's still from the woman's heart the capacity to love and be a woman. And so now we have this radical feminism. If this is the time of women. I'm going to explain that to you. But not that type of women. That type of woman is becoming more masculinized than feminine. Marianized. And what the Lord and the world needs are women that look like Mary. Not women that want to be like men. Let's 
allow men be men. And we are supposed to call men. We are supposed to be the ones to call forth the men, the true masculine genius. I'm going to tell you a little story. I'm sorry if I'm taking too much time. Okay. Because, you know, since I travel a lot, a lot of things happen to me, so I can't spend months telling you stories, but I'm going to tell you one. <laughs> I was coming from a week of giving a retreat to bishops and priests and all that that entails, not only the talks, the conversations, and then at night I was having Eucharistic cenacles, and, and then I was meeting with married women, and then I was meeting with single women. What a week. So when I got to the gate of the, to get into the plane, I was dead. I was drained. I was everything. All the verbs that you want to, that's what I was. And I'm running, and suddenly I sat down, and I don't know what kind of face I had, like, <sighs> And suddenly these two ladies approached me. But I knew in my heart, that they were religious sisters. And they sat down, they didn't even ask me, what is your name? Let's begin, but that's not right, isn't it? Education. Hello, what is your name? No, you know, they approached me, they said, don't you want to be a priest? <laughs> and I assure you, from the depth of my soul, I scream out, no! <laughs> and they looked at me like, what's wrong with this woman? <laughs> I said, you know, I am tired. I am dead. I am drained because I'm being given birth because I am a mother, because I am a woman, and I don't want to be a father. <laughs> I said, let them be fathers. I have enough with thousands and thousands and thousands of children all over the world. And besides being mother, I want to be a father. No, thank you. <laughs> Let them be fathers. I want to be a mother. You know, if Eve would have answered that, we wouldn't have the problems that we have. <laughs> if she would have said, no, I don't want to be that. Let me be a woman. That will be the end for Satan. So when he's telling you to be something else, you'll say, no, I just want to be a woman. I want to leave the power given by God to women, which we have a lot of power. It's just that we don't use it because we don't understand it, and so we use it wrongly. We have the capacity to understand what love calls us to do. We have the capacity given by God to respond to what love demands. Brothers and sisters, it was a lot easier for Mary Magdalene and the women to stay in their house, don't you think? It was a lot easier just to be crying in their houses and consoling each other and speaking about, oh, what did it have to happen to us, you know, poor us. It was a lot easier to be pitiful. But that's not who we are. They chose to do what love called them to do. They chose to go to the tomb and express his love, his consolation, his reparation to the wounded love of Jesus. And by doing a gesture of love that is born from the feminine and maternal heart of women, they show us what we are about. What are we about? Can you imagine a woman's heart being hidden in fear and leaving the one that she loves alone? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if somebody's coming to your house that you run to hide yourself and you don't care about your children? Can you imagine that? 
Even the airplanes still, thank God, have a right. They say, if the oxygen falls, the mask, put it first to the children, and then you put it to yourself, at least still they have a right. Because when they say, put it yourself to yourself and then to your children, don't get in that plane. <laughs> Can a woman think of herself first before the protection, the love, the care of the human person? No, we're not created for that. The culture is distorting our identity. Are we going to let it? That is the question I place to you. I, mother, everybody does it. Who cares? And why do you have to do what everybody does? At least be different. The world needs difference. If everybody does it, pray, because they're going through the path of perdition. They're going through the wrong path where they're not going to find happiness. But if you join them, you add to the problem, you don't become a solution. The actions of love and courage of Joseph or Arimathea, who gave in the Garden of Golgotha, the tomb that he just bought. <laughs> you just bought a house? And somebody needs it? Are you going to give it? No, you don't have to answer. I already know. <laughs> he hasn't even used his tomb because it was for himself. And this is another detail, dear sisters, because the gospel, because God is full of details of love. Jesus was born and who built his first little cradle? Joseph, his father. When he died, who gave him a home? Another man called Joseph. But there was a particularity about this tomb. The tomb was never used before. What does that speak of? Of the immaculate conception. As Jesus was conceived in a womb that was immaculate. An applause to a lady. As the Holy Spirit plays the God made man in a womb that is untouched only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Also, after death, his body could not be in any place that was used. It had to be in an immaculate place. The things of God are things of order. Never used. But they wrapped him. They wrapped him in a white linen. And then they left. And then on Sunday... Early Sunday, these women go, Mary Magdalene and the other women, go to see how is the body of our Lord, less anointing. Now, you, I can ask you a question. Have you ever thought why Our Lady wasn't going? She was not part of the group of the women that went on Sunday morning. Have you ever thought why? Is it because she forgot that it was her son? She didn't go because she was the only one that truly believed that he was going to be resurrected on Sunday. So she was just in prayer waiting for him. And also, it's a proof according to the fathers of the church, according to the popes, According to the saints and mystics and the last pope that spoke so profoundly about it, the first person that Jesus appeared to was to his mother. 
That's why when they enter the tomb, the tomb is empty. He is not there. So where was he? Eating ice cream? He was with his mother. The first to see her son was that a lady. The one that just two days before had held in her arms the wounded, bruised, broken body and dead body of her son. Now she's contemplating him in the glory of the resurrection. Can you imagine the eyes of our blessed mother glowing in glory, seeing her son, her son resurrected with the wounds because he did not want to erase them. And why doesn't want to erase them? When we want to erase everything that happens, I know people that there's a problem and they just got a blanket and they cover their faces. No, we have to confront situations with wisdom, with love, with reasoning, logic, things that are being lost at this time. But we can run, not run away. Well, Jesus was with his mother. I, I love to think about the moment when we go to Holy Land, actually. There is the place in the, in the Holy Sepulchre where Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene. But then in the Chapel of the Blessed Sacrament, where they repose the Blessed Sacrament, that's where you have a Eucharistic adoration, that is the chapel where Jesus appeared to his mother. Can you imagine? Mother! Son! I am alive! I always knew it! They don't believe it, but I did believe it. <laughs> the faith of the church is sustained in the faith of Our Lady. But let's go back to Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene entered the tomb, and what did she find? Oh, no, let me explain something. In the first entering of the tomb, she found an angel. So we see angels in the ministry of Christ's life in particular moments, not all the time. I, this is very important. Angels did not solve the problems of Christ, okay? We are in, in the desert, so the angels came flying, just bringing water and bread. No, 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 no. Just in the crucial moments of great suffering, like in the Mount of Temptations, an angel came to console him. In Gethsemane, an angel came to console him. In the crucifixion, there was no angels making the cross easier. Oh, let, we're going to lift it up for you, from your arms so it doesn't have to be heavy for you. No, no, no. But in the resurrection, there were angels. And so in the first entrance of Mary Magdalene with the women, they found that the tomb empty. Brothers and sisters, do you visit cemeteries? We all do, isn't it? Because we have people that we love in cemeteries. And we bring flowers or whatever, if it's children, or little things of children. Well, you know, one day I was with all the pilgrims in Holy Land, and I was looking at the thousands of people entering to the Holy Sepulchre, and I said, can you imagine? This is the only tomb in the whole world that for thousands of years, millions and millions and millions of people have come to visit a tomb that is empty. Let us applaud the Lord. <laughs> and so what, did they, what happened with the angel? They enter and they see this angel to the right side, full of light, clothed in a white robe, and they were amazed. Of course they were amazed. And he said to 
Magdalena and the women, do not be afraid, of course, because when we enter into the supernatural life, the first reaction of us limited human beings is fear. Do not be afraid. Are you seeking for Jesus of Nazareth? He's not here. He is raised as he said it. This is important. As he said it. Sisters, what Jesus says, it is always fulfilled. That is our power of trust and hope. So he said, go and tell the disciples. Go and tell them. And tell them that Jesus said that I was going to meet him in Galilee. So they run to tell the disciples and what, did, what happened. But it usually happened. They didn't believe her. These women are dreaming, you know. They want to see Jesus so much that they see Jesus. They think they're so mystical that they're seeing Jesus. They did not believe. But Peter and John, Peter and John are very crucial. Peter and John, they kind of believe. And they run. They didn't walk, sisters. They run. You know, we should be running to Mass every Sunday and every day. They run to see the tomb. They wanted to see what they were saying. They wanted to find Jesus. They run, and of course, John is younger. And what is the difference between a younger and an older? That the younger runs faster. So John got, got there first, but he doesn't enter. He waits for Peter to enter. Why? Because actually, if we're going to measure it by our logic, we're going to say, oh, John deserves to go in because John was at the foot of the cross, because John was faithful, because Peter was the denial. I mean, we can find all the reasons, but love has all the type of reasons. John knew that the head of the church was Peter, and the one that was called to confirm the faith of the disciples was Peter. So John stayed too allow Peter to enter because John is the charism of love. But the charism of authority is Peter. So he had to allow Peter to go, and when Peter entered and saw the tomb was empty and saw the clothes that Jesus left it very orderly, you know, what a job Mary and Joseph did with, it, with Jesus as a child. Called it very orderly with a clear distinction, the whole linen of the body in one side and the linens of the face in the other side. It all has a meaning. So when he, after he entered, John entered, and they saw the same. And they, they run to tell the apostles what they have seen. Not probably they were going to believe because Peter and John saw it. But Mary Magdalene went, following them. And she stayed outside of the tomb doing what? Weeping. Weeping and crying. Because what was her concern? What happened to the body of my Lord? That should be our concern. What happened to the Eucharist? What happened to the faith in the Eucharist? What happened to the reverence? The reverence of the heart. And that is speaking that you have to do and throw yourself on the floor and everything. That's your choice. I'm speaking about the reverence of your heart when receiving the Lord. What happened to your love and your care and reverence for the body of the Lord. She was crying, what happened to the body of my Lord? Who took it? I want to go get him. And when she's in this and this and that and crying, somebody appears. 
and said to her, Why are you seeking? Why are you seeking the living one among the dead? Isn't that a powerful question? That's what I tell everyone and I tell myself when we lose someone that we love. Yes, they're dead in their body, but they are more alive than us. So we have to remember that we haven't lost them. They're more than ever with us because they're not dead. They are alive and very much alive. He said, he's not here. How am I going to convince you he's not here? He's raised. He has been raised. Remember what he said in Galilee. So we can find that two times the angel said, remember what he said. So we understand that one of the ministry of the guardian angel put into work, dear sisters, one of the missions of the guardian angels is to remind us of the words of Jesus. So when you are desperate, what did Jesus say? Trust in me. Trust in me. Don't be anxious about what you're going to eat or what you're going to dress. The Lord was not calling us to live with the, uh, the eyes in all of our lives in fantasy, but what he's saying is these difficulties are under the eyes of the Father, and the Father is going to provide for you. The guardian angels, allow the guardian angels to speak to you and to remind you of the words of Jesus. Then something beautiful happened. He's still, he's still concerned. Okay, but where is it? And suddenly this man appears to Mary Magdalene that she didn't recognize. I don't fully understand why she didn't recognize him. So uh, unless that the glorification of the body, I don't know, it, because his face didn't change. I mean, his physiognomy didn't change. It just was glorified. Maybe it was so glorified after she has seen him totally disfigured, seeing this man in total glory. But, you know, this is the proof that that was a garden. She thought that he was a gardener. And he said, sir, did you take him? If you took him, just let me know where he is. And I can imagine Jesus kind of smiling inside. Don't you get it? Like he has to say to us. And then Jesus said, Mary. And at that moment, is that he realized that that unrecognizable man is Jesus resurrected. And then she said, Raboni, which means teacher, master. Brothers and sister, sisters and brother. <laughs> Why did she know that that was Jesus? Because he called her Mary. Because John 10 says that the good shepherd knows us by name. And he calls us by name. He doesn't say, beautiful disciple of mine. No, 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 no. Mercedes, Peter, John, Francesca, he called you by name. And she recognize his voice because John 10 said he calls them by name and the sheep recognize the voice of the good shepherd. This is a fulfillment of John 10. 
as it was a fulfillment of Song of Songs. Who doesn't love Song of Songs? It's the most beautiful loving chap uh, book. But you know, there is a there is a representation of a lady that loves someone and has loved that someone. And he said, I got out of my bed looking for the one I've been look I love. I have to do whatever it takes to find the one I love. I went through the streets, I asked everybody until I found them. That was a prophecy about Mary Magdalene. Brothers and sisters, women have a lot to give. I will say have a lot to say, but I don't want to say it because we say a lot. <laughs> we have a lot to give, especially at this time. The Bible is full of the particular mission of women, particular that sometimes save the life of a whole nation. One woman saved the life of a whole nation. Look at the power we have, if we know how to use it. If we know the power of our prayer, the power of our fasting, the power of our penance, the power of the merry and wisdom that is communicated to us. Because do not forget that the whole Bible is full of the heroic actions of love of women. Or oh, don't you think it was heroic? The act of Veronica? In the middle of that violence and mocking and people laughing and blaspheming, to step up, take her mantle, her white mantle, and clean the face of our Lord. I wish I could see it. And that action was rewarded by what? By Jesus leaving his face imprinted in his mantle. And now it's one of the biggest relics. Just like when a lady in St. Mary Magdalene went to pick up and take and guard and be the custodian of that linen that the body of Christ was wrapped with is that now we have the Shroud of Turin. And the one of the face, we have it in two places. That's why it was separated. So the Lord was saying, don't put me in the same place. Leave the Shroud of Turin in Turin and put the other ones in Manopelo and the other one in Oviedo. And we have two relics of the face of Christ resurrected with the signs of the wounds but also resurrected. You see, we women, uh, you know, don't keep things that are not necessary. Sometimes our closet, not mine, but your closet can be very full of things that are not necessary. Get rid of those things so you can keep and guard the things that are the treasures of Christ. We owe to St. Helen and other women, courageous women, all the relics of Jesus and his passion and the relics of our mother. We had the relic of the true cross thanks to our mother, thanks to St. Helen. Women have no limits when they love, even if they had to travel from, Je from Rome to Jerusalem, even like Mother Cabrini, that she had to travel from Italy to New York to find that she had no convent where to sleep. And that's why I was, I was smiling that the bishop mentioned that phrase because that's the phrase that I love the most. When she said to the bishop, no, yeah, you're right. I cannot be a, I cannot be a man because you wouldn't be able to do what I do. <laughs> but not because she was a feminist against men, because she was very clear of the maternal power to die to give life. Oblative love, whatever it takes. We have a great saying very close. You're very blessed. You should go to the tomb. We're going to go tomorrow. Because that's what founders do. Give their life for the work that the Lord has entrusted them to do. 
That's what you should do with your family. But now, we have a beautiful mission that I want you to hear. Because I don't know how much time I have. <laughs> this mission was given by the Second Vatican Council. Some people are having problems with the Second Vatican Council. I think they haven't read it, honestly. But look at what the Second Vatican Council did in closing the council. It closes it with a message to women. Are we very important that we close the council? Look at what the council said. Listen and try to understand. And these words of the council are the beginning of the most beautiful encyclical written by a pope about women, John Paul II, when he wrote, he wrote the encyclical, The Dignity of Women. He began with this. The hour is coming. That was in 1960. So if the hour was coming, in fact, he said, it has already come. So we're living in this hour. We are the women of this hour. Scream it. We are the women of this hour. But then, you know, every year has a task. When the vocation of women is being acknowledged in its fullness. Are you listening? So when they tell you, oh, the church doesn't give you any understanding, doesn't value the place of women. What? The church is saying it is the hour of women. And this vocation of women is being acknowledged by first, who are the first? The women has to be the first. And then the church, and then society. In its fullness, that means that they didn't understand it before, no, but they didn't understand it in its fullness, which is totally different. The hour in which women acquire, listen to this, this is very important, acquire in the world an influence. Do you have the power to influence the world? Hi, that didn't sound like you have <laughs> the power. Do you have the power to influence the world? with a hundred things that I don't want to mention, just in case somebody has it here, with a hundred things that look like you're not a woman, I don't know what you look like. No, with the power of being a woman, you have the power to influence the world. You have the power to create an effect that means change. We have the power to change the world. We have the power to do that, said the council and John Paul, like never before. Are you going to understand why? That is why at this moment, it continues, when the human race is undergoing so, such a deep transformation, is it not true? We cannot even recognize our world. Even the atheists tell me that. This is not a Christian problem. This is a humanity problem. We cannot recognize our world. Everything is turned around. Nothing is the same. Everything goes like no consequences. We cannot recognize our world. It's a transformation that not necessarily is all positive. There is positive things, but there's a lot of negative things and sinful things. Well, in a world that is like that, the Lord needs women. 
But women, says the Council on Jean Paul, imbued, o sea, rellenadas, para que me entiendan en español, imbued with the spirit of the gospel. No, no, it's not just any woman. With the spirit of the gospel, and only those women can do so much for the, the world not to fall. Brother, uh, dear sisters, who is the woman imbued with the spirit of the gospel? We are. We are if we're marrying. The only woman totally imbued with the spirit of the gospel is the Blessed Mother. And so therefore, to be able to fulfill this prophecy, we need to become Marian women. We need to look like a lady. We need to act like a lady. We need to speak like a lady. We need to pray like a lady, and we need to have the power of a lady because all of that is being given to us to change the world. Yeah. Women have been entrusted, said Jean Paul, with the greatest gift. We have entrusted with a human person. It is the greatest gift, is the, the greatest dignity that we have is to be a human person. We're not animals. We're not even the most beautiful mountains that there are in the world, which are beautiful, but we're not that. We're greater than that. We are children of God. And brothers and sisters, and sisters do not allow yourselves to be confused in this world that the cat is as worthy as you. And again, I have to clarify that I don't have so much problems with cats. It's just that it's easy to use that example. But we are living in a world that somebody leaves an inheritance of $50 million to her dog when there is so many children dying and starving. So who are the ones that are going to reorder the priorities and the primacy of love? Women. To us has been entrusted by the Lord the capacity to make love a priority. Because we live in a world that love is not a priority. When you go to some place, and I'm going to mention, I'm not going to mention, and the first thing they say, well, do you have money to pay for that? That's the first question. Instead of knowing what is your heart desiring, what are your needs? You see, our world is turned around, and it is the mission of women to turn it around because there is a woman that changed history forever. And with her, yes, History was parted in two. Her yes began a new era for the mission of women in the life of the church and the kingdom of God. Without her yes, without a simple yes, you know how many yeses you say in the day? A simple yes changed history and brought from heaven, God made men to save us from our sins. Have you ever thought what would it have been of us if she said no? A simple yes of you, 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 and me can change history. And don't think that because it's a little yes, it's not changing. Sometimes we think that the things we do are little. The economy of love has another measure. Love is never little. 
love is always the power to change the human heart and to change society and to change the world. There's a lot of people that live without knowing that the tomb where Jesus laid is empty. And who are going to be the Mary Magdalene's of this time? Who was called the apostle of the apostles because she went to announce he is not dead. He is risen. And if our Lord is risen, if our Lord is alive, what is our mission, sisters? To bring people to him. You should have as a mission every Sunday, bring somebody to the church and let Jesus touch them. You just bring him and say, he's alive there. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Can take away your sins, can heal your wounds, can make you a new creation. We cannot be in our comfort zones because we're going to be drowned. We have to get up with our spices and oils, whatever that is, whatever gift you have, go and give it to the Lord because the world is in need of women imbued with the spirit of the gospel. Mary and women who can change the world with a simple yes to the will of God. Be like our lady, women of the fiat, to whatever it is that the Lord called you to, so you can also be called blessed among women, so you can also be a blessed fruit of her immaculate womb, because you look like your mother. God bless you. Thank you.